This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. As sea levels rise, more and more coastal areas are getting flooded worldwide. 800 million people from across 570 cities may have to relocate by 2050. But instead of relocating the people, what if we moved our cities instead? Someone is floating the idea of building an island city over the ocean. But is this water world just a fantasy? Or will we see some of these technologies emerge back on dry land? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. So why are architects looking to escape from our dry land ship? In his TED Talk, Bjark Engels covered the effects of sea level rise on coastal cities around the world. By 2050, 90% of major cities across the globe will be facing a wave of climate change. Some have already taken action against this, like Shanghai, which is going to experience sea level rises by up to two feet by 2050. To keep itself dry, the Chinese metropolis has already surrounded 520 kilometers of its shoreline with protective seawalls. And there's also the Hafen City floodproof neighborhood in Hamburg, which has waterproof buildings placed on mounds and a gate system that closes off the ground floors in case of a flood. Or the Hammerby Lake City in Stockholm, where wet gardens handle stormwater. When Hurricane Sandy's surge hit Manhattan in 2012, it left 500,000 homes in the dark. Engels Group Big has now designed the Dryline Project to protect the financial core of New York City from future hurricane-driven floods. With a cocktail of climate security and leisure facilities, this seven mile long water repellent ribbon features green parks, seating areas, bicycle shelters, and more. But are seawalls a viable dry run in the long term? Well, according to the Center for Climate Integrity, by 2040, the US will have spent $400 billion trying to protect coastal cities from the rising ocean. Now, clearly that sounds like an unsustainable cost, but Ingle's visionary mind seems to have a solution for that too. Besides functional seawalls, the Danish architect is also the creative mind behind Oceanix City, a UN-supported floating city project. And this isn't the only plan getting floated. While there is some really interesting progress to make the floating dream come true, which I'll get to in a bit, floating cities have some significant challenges, as you can probably imagine. While I don't think we'll be living in Kevin Costner's Waterworld future, New Orleans might be a suitable location for a sequel. It ticks all of the boxes. Some areas of the city are sinking at a rate of two inches per year and could be underwater by 2100. Also, the Crescent City is located on the Mississippi River Delta, and some areas are up to nearly 10 feet below sea level. Not to mention storm surges. You can probably see why some engineers suggested seasteading to save New Orleans. But what is seasteading? Well, basically, it's about developing a permanent settlement offshore. In other words, instead of a homestead, it's a seastead. Kind of makes sense. If you think about it, there are already examples of seasteads floating around in the ocean, like anti-aircraft platforms, cargo ships, or even oil rigs. So can we just place an entire city like New Orleans on a shipyard? There are obviously a few challenges with that, like the weight of the city, which would push the shipyard hull 300 feet underwater. Also, a New Orleans-sized shipyard would be bigger than the three biggest shipyards in the world combined. But the most tricky obstacle is waves. In fact, their impact on the massive shipyard would cause structural failure. So what do we do? A solution would be that we could create a flexible system that basically surfs the waves, which means interlinking much smaller pieces into a bigger structure rather than having a single, massive, rigid platform. The floating New Orleans could take inspiration from the Netherlands. An Amsterdam water studio and other architects have already developed a floating village hosting 100 people spread across 46 homes that are staying afloat. Besides providing shelter, the city should be able to sustain itself to let people live independently from the mainland. A bit like living on a long-term cruise ship. As for energy, besides wind turbines and solar panels, the ocean is the obvious source. With a really interesting technology, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion, or OTEC, is one of the most promising technologies. This relies on the natural ocean water temperature gradient between the surface and lower depths, which can be converted into electrical energy. But how does it work? Well, in a closed-loop OTEC system, the warmer surface water vaporizes a low boiling point fluid like ammonia. The produced steam travels through the pipelines until reaching a turbine that is coupled with a generator. To close the loop, colder ocean water is pumped from lower depths to liquefy the hot ammonia vapor and use it again. The interesting thing here is that the waste cooling water can be fed to aquaculture facilities to grow food, like fish and algae. Also, an open-loop OTEC plant would have fresh water as a byproduct. In fact, instead of ammonia, this configuration vaporizes surface seawater by reducing its pressure. So when you condense it back into a liquid form, you're left with desalinated water. 
Overall, an OTEC facility could possibly source clean energy, food, and drinking water to an offshore urban infrastructure. But are there any ready-to-float projects coming to the surface? Well, with the help of Danish architect Bjark Engels that I mentioned earlier, and French Polynesia ex-Minister of Tourism Mark Collins Chen, they're creating a UN-supported floating city project called Oceanic City. It'll be formed by hexagonal islands, each covering the size of about three and a half football pitches. Every floating neighborhood will host about 300 people. Following a stepwise modular design, OceanX will first develop a six-island village as its core unit of their offshore infrastructure. The village will have its own services like healthcare and education, it's pretty much what you expect. And as part of that seascape, all structures including bamboo and wood-made houses will be below seven stories or better to resist the wind. If that works, they'll upscale the project by developing six connected villages until reaching a total capacity of about 10,800 people. The mobile islands will be assembled on dry land and then towed into place. Each unit will support customized functional edges that range from plantations to public spaces or marinas. And designers will also include small desert islands to ring the archipelago. Besides cushioning the waves and the wind blows, these units will have specific functions like solar energy generation and food production. The first prototype will be tested around the equator area, where most of the city would be outdoors. This would also reduce the energy needed for growing food. An innovative material called biorock or cement, I'm not even joking, that's the actual name for it, cement, will safely anchor each island to the bottom of the ocean a mile off the coast. Now you can create this material underwater through an electrochemical process powered by renewable energy. Basically, you apply a current between a steel bar acting as a cathode and a much smaller anode. This makes seawater minerals precipitate, forming a limestone layer around the bar. With similar properties to those of concrete, this material is durable and binds itself to the ocean bedrock which makes for a very stable mooring point for the floating platform. On top of that, it works as an artificial reef, providing food and shelter for marine life, and the island is designed to withstand a Category 5 hurricane and tsunamis. Mark Chen, the Oceanix founder, envisions this project as a closed-loop system, where the island can rely on its own water, food, and energy stock. Engineers proposed a triple water supply scheme. First, they'll tap into that giant sky reservoir by collecting and storing rainfall. In addition, they'll leverage the immense ocean tank by building a solar-powered desalination plant. And then finally, what if I told you Oceanix could supply the rest of its water from solar panels that harvest water out of air humidity? Launched by the Zero Mass Water Startup in 2015, this hydro panel called Source can provide up to five liters of water per day. Ben Sullins has published a couple of really good videos about this and his experience using Source panels on his home. Definitely go check those out and I'll include links in the description. The module has an internal fan that pulls in humid air and pushes it through a spongy material. The trapped water vapor is then condensed, mixed with minerals, and stored in a tank that connects to your water tap. And you can also check out how clean the water is. In fact, the company developed a sensor for quality monitoring that transfers data to an app. Although it costs $2,500 including installation, the CEO has said that investing in source would be cheaper than buying water bottles in the long run. Now, based on Oceanix forecasts, each person living in the floating city would consume less than half the water used by an average Congo citizen. To achieve that, they'll collect both wastewater and gray water, treat it on site, and then reuse it. As for food, Oceanix citizens will have a pescatarian diet, and they're dedicating up to 32,000 square feet of space for crop cultivation on each island. These will include five core systems, outdoor communal gardens, indoor farming, aquaponics, aeroponics, and 3D ocean farming. In that last system, which is really kind of cool, you'd have horizontal ropes laying over the water's surface and underwater lines running along the entire ocean water column. The ropes are anchored by hurricane-proof floats, while the lines support seaweed crops and hanging cages to grow seafood. But what about food waste? They're hoping to solve that problem through reusable containers and anaerobic digesters to convert food scraps into natural fertilizers and energy. Based on the city design, 60% of the transport could rely on sustainable solutions like walking, cycling, hydrofoil taxis, which sound amazing, and other types of sharing mobility. But will the city have enough energy to power all of this? Besides harnessing waste to energy, waves, solar and wind infrastructures, the project's creators will give an energy budget to each floating citizen to try to keep the power consumption under control. Also, by fanning out the building facades, architects will leverage the self-shading to save on cooling and gain on solar coverage. The first Oceanix marine metropolis will be tested near the Pearl River Delta in the Guangdong Chinese province. Apparently, the company aims to deliver the project by 2030. But is Oceanix City really unsinkable? 
well, it's hard to tell as some of the technologies that they're meant to be using are still at a very early stage. Plus, they haven't provided enough details on how the city will be run, how much it will cost, and where they're going to be getting the funds to build it. For instance, what if private investors were to build one of the islands without being subjected to any specific rules? In that case, the floating paradise could easily turn into a climate haven for whoever can afford to escape rising sea levels. You know, the rich. Also, lying one mile off the coast, the isolated urban system may have troubles in case of sudden emergency disruptions. It would take a while to get engineers to come fix any issues. Yet whether or not Oceanex will make it work, some of their ideas such as water and waste recycling could loop back to the mainland cities. Although these projects sound futuristic and will take some years to complete, smaller scale floating structures will soon be commonplace. Like floating villages in the Netherlands, for instance. And it's not just about cities. You might have the chance to experience a solo floating adventure. The Seasteading Institute, which is a nonprofit organization based in California, is supporting ocean builders for their sea pods development. The company is currently building their prototypes in Panama using 3D printers. Rather than cities, they're focusing on individual seasteads for tourists and businesses. But back in May of 2020, Ocean Builder's CEO said the first floating pod would have been ready by last November. However, no pods have popped up on the horizon yet. Maybe COVID delayed their plans. And if you have some spare money for a special cruise, you could rent an eco-friendly floating home in Brittany. You can get on board for just $336 a night. Not exactly a bargain. Running on solar power, this luxury 540 square foot pod has built-in water treatment systems to avoid polluting seawater. But there are more affordable options. In 2016, Big, which is Bjark Engel's company, stacked nine shipping containers onto a platform docked in the port of Copenhagen. These have now become low-cost accommodations for 12 students. Each unit is warmed up using seawater thermal energy and is powered by solar panels. With rising populations and sea levels, we're desperate for more living space. While economic and technical viability are still to be proven, floating cities could turn a threat into an ocean of resources. Seasteading may be the new frontier for urbanization, but even if it doesn't, it could serve as a springboard for new technologies like 3D printing, waste management, and ocean energy that would come in handy back on the mainland. And if you're fascinated by all the crazy engineering that's involved with building a floating city, and you wanna dig a little deeper into the physics of how things like this work, I'd strongly recommend checking out the Physics of Everyday course at Brilliant. It's one of my favorites from Brilliant because it covers such an awesome array of things like how ocean tides work and why and how skyscrapers are designed to sway. A lot of similar things to how floating cities are getting designed. It's really cool stuff. But even if physics doesn't matter to you, they have over 60 courses including topics in computer science, quantum mechanics, and mathematics. They've got something for everybody. All of the concepts are taught through fun and interactive challenges that help you understand the why of something, not just the how. It helps you to develop your intuition, which is my favorite part about Brilliant, and it taps into the way I learn, and it just makes it fun. Go to brilliant.org slash undecided to sign up for free. The first 200 people will get 20% off their annual premium membership. Thanks to Brilliant and all of you for supporting the channel. So what do you think? Do you think floating cities are still a sci-fi future like Waterworld, or do you think we might get something out of this? Jump into the comments and let me know. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you think I've earned it. And as always, a big thank you to all my patrons, and I'm about to butcher a whole bunch of names here because I'm about to welcome a whole bunch of new people, but new Supporter Plus member Akissiak Sinclair Strom, and producers Philip Fuchs, Andrew, Sushank, and Cassiano Moraes. He's actually one of the researchers and writers that helps me out in these videos, so a big thank you to him. If you've liked my mycelium fungus video, he's one of the guys that helped on that. So big tip of the hat to Cassiano. Your support really helps to make these videos possible. And if you join, you'll get access to each video early without ads on Patreon. And I hold monthly Zoom calls for higher level supporters and producers. It's been really great getting to know a bunch of you. You can help influence what topics are covered. And if you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I have linked to right here. And of course, thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.